Hi, I'm Janice Switlow, and today I'm taking you back to the 1700s to explain how what was happening then continues to happen today, but the difference in terms of impact today that's critical for Indigenous nationals to be aware of. I'm referencing again a book called The Path of Destiny by Thomas Randall from eight, uh, 1957, and it's uh, discussing the history uh, just before uh, 1774. Um, and, um, you know, the issues that were ongoing um, between the British and the Americans. And it says, um, indeed, in this whole matter of employing Indians in the approaching civil war in America, there were wise men on both sides hoping to keep the savages quiet, just as there were others striving even now to enlist them in one cause or the other. Britons and Americans afterward engaged in a pot and kettle business of accusing each other on the point. The fact was that both parties bribed and used Indians from the start. The main difference was in the savage mind. The Indians had much more resentment against the Long Knives who took their lands, they didn't really, uh, than against the stolid redcoats whose only desire was to draw their pay and drink their grog and get back to England as soon as their time of service passed. For that reason, many more Indians took King George's gifts and fought in the great white father's cause, but the stain was on both flags throughout the war, and the victims suffered one as much as another. And... Um, in discussing this further, nothing excused the use of Indians by the British, or for that matter, by the Americans. Most of the savages had old grudges to pay off against the quote unquote long knives, or the English, or each other. And in this um, old time frontier warfare, they took the opportunity. Uh, this was also true of various white outcasts. Um, the turmoil of the time gave room to all sorts of private quarrels, etc. So uh, my point of bringing this up is that indigenous nations and their leaders um, took advantage of the situation. Why not, right? Um, they saw two warring parties. Um, they were being, you know, bid on for their services. You know, this was diplomacy in, in action. Americans trying to bribe and use, but another way to consider it is Americans trying to persuade through diplomatic um, approaches, which included gifts, uh, the same as the, the British are trying to do the same thing. Um, so uh, while this book suggests it was kind of, you know, a little more petty and opportunist, and I'm not to discount that there are individuals that took full advantage of this and did, you know, individual indigenous nationals. But at this time, uh, everything that I've researched and, and, and looked at and heard um, suggests that, you know, the leaders were truly concerned for their people. They were still very much in touch with and abiding by their own indigenous laws. That changed later, you know, when the, some, uh, you know, grants a very, uh, um, controversial figure on that, um, you know, how, how some leaders, if you will, suddenly changed to uh, when they thought, you know, there was no way to win it, if you will, that things, you know, the writing was on the wall, so they might as well take advantage uh, for themselves um, and left behind adherence to Indigenous law at that point. And this is the controversy we have today, right? It's at the time where this could all be viewed as clear diplomacy, you know, one nation approaching another nation to say, join us in our efforts against this other nation, um, and equality and recognition, and indigenous nationals, leaders or otherwise, uh, firmly, con con you know, uh, adhering to their indigenous laws. Today, we still have the situation of, you know, bribes and using uh, happening, but it's in a different context now. It truly is, I would suggest to you, uh, in, you know, in, you know, modern times, if you will, that this truly is bribing and using. Um, 
I don't see much adherence to Indigenous law with respect to elected chief and council being asked to sign in on things and being dangled carrots, including First Nation Land Management Act, you know, adjusting that policy to entice them to enter on the basis that, you know, you'll get all the trust funds delivered to your personal bank account, your chief and council bank account, with no checks and balances possible by band members, whose those are their collective assets, they'll come into this within the sole control of chief and council without any, you know, reporting requirements, no checks and balances. There are no independently wealthy indigenous nationals that I know of who are willing to commit $10 million to act as a check and balance in order to be able to pursue civil actions against any potential wrongdoing uh, in the handling of that money. That, you know, the hardest thing, once money's gone, even though you can trace it a certain amount, it's still very hard to get back, if not impossible. And most times with fraud like that, a breach of fiduciary duty, you know, you're throwing more good money after bad in the sense of just chasing an outcome that, quite frankly, is very difficult to expect. So, you know, this is a standard methodology, except today there's no attempt to cloak this as diplomacy in action. You know, um, it's a fine line, if you will, right? Um, you know, whether what's being offered is in the context of a diplomatic discussion and relationship, you know, nation to nation, or whether it is personal bribes incentives that say hey yeah you can control these multi-million dollars of you know and it's unspoken by the way there's no chains on that it's up to you you've got you know this will be supported under self-government we will never get involved um you know well who wouldn't want to consider uh, multiple millions of dollars within their own control um, particularly dangerous when those persons who may be in leadership roles, have come through a scenario of residential school and through a, you know, the, the kinds of oppressions uh, and circumstances that quite frankly lead to creation of sociopaths and narcissists who don't care, don't have the capacity to care. Never mind follow Indigenous laws, but really do not have the capacity to care one whit about their people. In fact, have been indoctrinated and primed to consider their people just like the Doctrine of Discovery did and does. So they're not really, you know, they're not really, uh, you know, human. I, however, I'm being accepted and, uh, you know, I'm going to be accepted into this great body of civilized human beings and I will have power. It's a sad situation, right? Uh, but be clear, even those people who are tempted by this, and there's nothing to constrain you except your spiritual beliefs and your obligations to your people, whether that means anything to you or not. The fact is that once Canada gets what it needs, they'll have no more use for you either. You might have fun time with some money in the, be in the beginning, but your uh, next generations will not be part of that elite. They will not be welcomed into the places where you're being um, tolerated, quite frankly, right now, because they can use you. That's all I have to say.